Japan, the land of cherry blossoms, samurai, and one of the world's strictest workplace cultures. As a country situated in an area of the world where left-wing and strong labor movements have had great impact on the modern history of its neighboring states, be it the communist revolution in China, guerrillas in Southeast Asia, or the role of the South Korean labor movement in its democratization, the history of similar groups in Japan has eluded me, and a quick search on YouTube gave no real results. The history of domestic affairs in modern Japan that I know of is mainly the role of the oligarchy in modernizing Japan during the Meiji Restoration. And when I have heard about the left and labor movements, it is always in relation to the reactionary and militaristic groups of interwar Japan, whose extreme fear and hatred of socialism even overshadowed that same fear in Hitler's Germany. Therefore, I decided to make a video about the 1870 to 1970 time period. But since the history of these movements are so large and vibrant, I will have to, for my own and your sake, make this into a multi-part series. First, as always when discussing historical events, some background is necessary. 60 years after the first large-scale strike in England, and 20 years after Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto, we begin the story of the socialist and labor movement in Japan in 1868 when the 200-year-old Tokugawa shogunate was removed from power by the Meiji Restoration. This restoration occurred mostly due to that shogunate's unwillingness and lack of ability to make the necessary reforms to be able to resist the gunboat diplomacy of the Western powers, which was seen as an existential threat toward Japan. The new regime centralized power around the emperor and several powerful families in Japan, in order to more easily facilitate the modernization of the country. One of the main parts of this modernization was rapid industrialization. While the nation lacks the massive industries that France, the UK, the US and the soon united Germany had, Japan still had a large manufacturing sector employing some 5% of the population. The state quickly seized on this potential and used it as a base for industrialization. It would especially harness this capacity in the production of silk and cotton products, which was in the 1880s the first industry where mechanized factories began appearing in earnest throughout Japan. This sector would be so pivotal that the silk and cotton industry would encompass three-fifths of Japan's exports by the second decade of the 20th century, and was the sector that by far treated their workers the worst. This industrialization program was so successful that by the start of the First World War, 853,000 people were employed as industrial workers, some 1.6% of the population, which, while still small compared to the nearly 10% in the industrial giant that was Germany in 1913, it was still a remarkable increase as it had doubled in less than 14 years and would continue to grow at rapid speed. With this, Japan had thus created an expansive and quite modern industrial sector in mainly the cities of Kobe, Osaka, Kyoto, Yokohama and of course Tokyo. However, even though the industrial workforce grew, hardly any of the modernization made life for the workers any better and most of the employee-employer relationships in the workplace were still based on the ideal of the old paternal tradition of master and apprentice, or oyakata, and the Confucian ideas of harmony in society still held great sway. There was therefore a growing resentment from the workers, and Japan, just like industrial nations of Europe, would begin to experience the increasing demands of the working population by the last decade of the 1800s. There are many stories of attempts to form labor unions in many of the big sectors, such as mining, traditional artisanry, and newer occupations such as railway work, which all have fascinating and important histories. However, if I went through every single area, I would be rambling on for hours and hours. Therefore, I will focus on the more general history and the most important sectors and events in Japan. One of the first notes to make which is of particular importance for both the industrial corporations themselves but also the labor movement was that of the low worker retention. 
This was especially prominent in the harsh textile industry where a majority of the workers were women, whose main way of resisting the working conditions that led to disease and workdays of between 12 and 16 hours was simply running away back to the rural villages from where they often were recruited from. In one such case on June the 14th, 1896, over a hundred girls at Amamiya Silk Reeling Company, located in Kofu in Yamanashi Prefecture, where, as Sheldon Guerin writes in The Origins of Japanese Social Policy 1868-1918, working hours had been lengthened. The girls had to commute to work while it was still dark. One girl at the mill was attacked by a ruffian while her on her way to work, and this sparked a protest by the entire mill. The girls left the mill in a group and proceeded to a nearby Buddhist temple to decide what to do. Management, surprised by this action, sought to determine the girls' grievances and after discussions with the leaders decided to shorten working hours by one hour and to investigate other ways to improve working conditions. Despite lack of planning, organization, recognition by employers, a strike fund, collective bargaining and all other characteristics of a modern strike, the girls at Amamiya Mill had won concessions from the company. However, these actions were still spontaneous and lacked any organized trade unions, which meant that they were in many ways more similar to peasant protests before the Meiji Restoration, rather than the massive strikes that held great sway in the West. The actual organized labor movement can be mainly traced back to 1895 when the first trade union in Japan was created in the heavy metalworks industry. This union was formed with much more ease than similar attempts in other sectors as this completely modern sector took its management strategy from the West and not the traditional oyakata system which meant that workers had much more knowledge and autonomy at the workplace. It was also formed with aid from emigre to America, Takano Fusataro, who in 1896 returned to Japan. Takano, sometimes known as the founder of the Japanese labor movement, came from a poor family yet had studied economics and had experience of organizing labor unions in the US. While in the US, Takano had also sought out prominent leaders of unions, such as Samuel Gompers, to learn from. From what had he learned, his main focus when returning to Japan was the promotion of class consciousness and smaller local unions. He therefore formed the Rodeo Kumiai Kisekai, or the Association for Promotion of Labor Unions, in 1897 to hold lectures and promote the idea of unions throughout Japanese workplaces. It gained a significant boost when workers were angry that the immense increase in industry after the Sino-Japanese War did not result in increased wages due to that problem we today are so troubled by, inflation. This resulted in a massive strike by employees of Japanese railway companies which forced negotiations in favor of the workers. Yet even with these events, most unions remained small scale and many quickly dissolved. One of the reasons to why it was so difficult to create labor organizations was that the state quickly moved to legislate anti-union laws, such as Article 17 of the police regulations, which prohibited the act of instigating or inciting others to strike, join unions or engage in collective bargaining. The last of the major Meiji unions, the Railway Union Reform Society, was dissolved by these means in 1901. Being a latecomer to the industrial race had allowed the early labor movement to learn from the experiences of other nations. But they were not the only ones to take this into account. So did the state. For example, the Meiji administration did this by taking a page out of Bismarck's handbook in the state's handling of social policy and therefore sometimes taking the lead on legislation in labor protection in order to increase the security of the state and increase productivity. For example, when the Home Ministry's Goto Chimpe first proposed Bismarckian social insurance in 1895, he did so in terms of a 100-year state plan to prevent the rise of a socialist party, the very idea of which he found abhorrent. One person who also favored this approach and founded the Social Policy School of Thought in Japan was quite fascinatingly none other than Takano Fusataro's younger brother Iwasaburo. Iwasaburo, just like his brother, favored unions. 
Yet it is important to remember that he remained a minority in his own school who did favor this. Most still rejected unions out of hand. The ideas on state social policy, however, favored by people such as Shinpei and Iwasaburu, opened up for discussions of the need for new laws protecting workers. The discussions crystallized into legislation with the factory law, which had begun being formulated due in part because of the earlier mentioned strikes during the industrial boom after the Sino-Japanese War. Of note is that this act was also proposed by the first cabinet, which was formed by elected parties and not the Meiji oligarchs in 1898. This meant that the act was however soon tabled when that same government fell in October of the same year. The failure of this law was of great importance as it meant that the Takano brothers both distanced themselves for a time from the labor movement, the older dying a few years later never to return. Those who would carry on the torch, such as Katayama Sen, were also radicalized by this failure of this act, becoming not only very pro-union, but also pro-socialism. This also created a split within the Kisekai, between followers of Katayama's more radical ideas and those wishing for gradual change and harmony in the workplace. Labor unions was not the only idea imported from abroad, but so were the socialist ideas that had taken such a stronghold of workplaces in Europe. The first socialists in Japan emerged around the growing slums of Japanese cities and who, rather than focusing on radical change, tried to work philanthropically in these areas based on ideas of Christian socialism. Those who were not Christian socialists were most often inspired by the left-leaning Narodniks of Russia, whose main focus was democratization rather than the destruction of capitalism. The early introductions of socialism was also often morphed together with Japanese cultural traditions. For example, some early Japanese socialists incorporated Confucian ideas to, to justify state socialism where the problems were not capitalism but rather that society lacked a good state built upon the idea of treating their citizens righteously. Even with the convoluted and sometimes contradicting theory of early Japanese socialism, soon attempts to the creation of a formal organizations began. While there are earlier organizations, the first major attempt was in 1901 when the Social Democratic Party was formed by Katayama Sen and several other prominent socialists. Its party program was made up of 28 demands, some which were not that radical, other which gained them the ire of conservative elements of society. The founders hoped that by forming a reformist social democratic party, they could replicate the success of the German social democratic party, which had managed to grow into the main political party in Imperial Germany. However, due to the rampant intolerance and fear that the party would be able to succeed in a similar fashion to the German SPD, the government under Taro Katsura forcefully dissolved the party after less than a day. When the later Socialist Party was able to form in 1906 under a more lenient government, it still only lasted just one year due to the promoting the radical idea of direct action outside the traditional political sphere. One thing to note about the early socialist movement in Japan was that it was mainly formed by those typically considered middle class. Most members were often artisans or other more intellectual professions, and not a part of the proletariat. A prime example is that the founders of the Social Democratic Party, Abe Iso and Kotoko Shuisu, and Sakai Toshihiko, one of the founders of the Socialist Party, were fascinatingly formed families with samurai lineage. It is quite intriguing that the class that held power prior to the Meiji Restoration would turn to such radical progressive theories when so many of samurai lineage, especially in the in later interwar years, turned to extreme reactionary thoughts. However, this is not completely unprecedented, as it often occurs that when elites are disenfranchised, they turn to radicalism on both the left and the right. The samurai heritage also had an impact on why socialism fit into their worldview, as these men grew up with the traditional disgust for the materialism of the merchant class during the Tokugawa era. But why were the working class such a small part in the founding of groups which promised their emancipation? Some reasons were that socialist thought had still not permeated into the consciousness of the working class. 
Yet the mere fact remained that the fact that in those days to be marked by the police as a socialist meant to immediately lose one's job. A risk few poor people would be willing to take. The spread of early socialist movement in Japan also suffered because the socialist and communist ideas entered Japan sporadically and almost all literature was banned. For example, Sakai Toshihiko, who was one of the Japanese participants of the Second International in 1899, hadn't read the Communist Manifesto before he translated it in 1904. Uh, fun fact about his publication, which was allowed in a theoretical journal in 1906, but not in any left-leaning paper, it would be the only complete translation of the Manifesto in Japan until after the end of the Second World War. And even when texts on socialist theory were translated, they hit a roadblock when trying to translate terms that were not yet applicable to the burgeoning capitalist society of Japan, words such as proletariat or the bourgeoisie. Yet things would change, and the socialist movement in Japan had its greatest change after the Russo-Japanese War, when syndicalist and anarchist ideas began to take hold in Japan. These ideas mainly grew in popularity due to the harsh repressiveness of the state and employers toward any grassroots attempts to improve conditions for the working class. These ideologies also grew more and more when reformist ideals such as social democracy had begun to show their inability to have any effect at all as the state had no intention of working together with anyone who even dared mention socialism. Many socialists were therefore drawn to these newer ideas as they began to come to the conclusion that more militant action was the only way to create a change in Japan, even with a labor movement still in its infancy. Socialist ideas were not the only thing affected by the Russo-Japanese war. Even with a more or less non-existent organized labor movement, workplace tensions remained, they even grew. For example, in the textile and heavy industries, 100 significant disputes erupted between 1902 and 1917. Other sectors were also affected and began to radicalize. One such place where radically different methods were seen was in the mining industry, where several disputes in 1907 led to explosive confrontations. And when I say explosive, I mean explosive in the way that the miners used dynamite to show their dissatisfaction. For example, in a mine in Beshi, the damage done to property and police even forced an intervention by the military. Such signs show the increasing power of the workers. Not only were there an increase in workplace disputes, but also several mayor riots in Tokyo happened in the aftermath and the years following the war between Russia and Japan. And even though the main issues of these riots were either increased suffrage or in issues with foreign policy, a large part of the involved were still members of the lower working class and showed what potential they had. The riots would also have a big importance later down the line since they would be a critical part in the shift toward a more democratic Japan that would allow more socialist and labor movements. The disputes and riots also resulted in the factory law being revived in 1911 in what former chief of the labor bureau Oka Minoru stated, championed almost exclusively by the government and academic experts. It did not result from bargaining with workers or their organizations, nor did the parties ever deal with it as a political question. It was purely a question of protecting labor. However, this story isn't all rosy. The heavy corporatism and intertwining between politicians and businessmen also resulted in a parliamentary diet that championed increased revenue over workers and would therefore postpone the implementation of the law. And even when the law was implemented, the main focus of it was not workers' rights, but rather the health of the nation's people, and especially would-be soldiers, and was therefore mainly directed at protection of women and children. And if that meant some protection for workers as a whole, so be it. The socialist movement also took another hit when Katsura came back as prime minister in 1908, and his cabinet spared no time in repressing the budding socialist movement. Its biggest strike came in 1910, when several prominent members of socialist movements, such as Kotoku, were executed for partaking in an alleged anarchist plot to murder the emperor. A plot most of them probably had no role at all in, but they were socialist and therefore suspect. However, 
even with most left-wing and labor agitation still outlawed, some groups still attempted to improve workers' conditions. Most did this by trying to contribute to harmony and cooperation between labor and capital. One of these groups that used this label to avoid repression while also attempting to promote unions was the UIKI, or Friendly Society, which was founded in 1912 partially by Takano Iwasaburu. This framing allowed the movement to grow, and by 1916 it had grown to some 20,000 members in the main urban areas of Tokyo and Osaka, and it would have a large role in the interwar era. So, by the eve of the First World War, the Japanese labor movement was nowhere near its contemporary counterparts in the West. Even though the Takano duo had created a foundation for the creation of unions, the authoritarian regime was ever vigilant in its attempts to stamp out any and all dangerous thoughts. One of the main reasons for the state's hostile relation towards union and socialism was not only that it feared any resistance toward the authoritarian rule, no matter how small it was, but rather that the sectors that were most at risk of unionizing were the metalworks and the railways, two sectors vital for national defense. The rapid industrialization had thus created a modern economy for Japan. But the social and political developments that had proceeded parallel to industrialization in the West was still lagging behind. The events of the interwar era would, however, create an avenue for these changes to finally take a hold in Japan, but also result in the deadliest blow against them. The rapid modernization had also planted the seeds for a socialist movement. However, by 1917 it was still unable to fully form be it due to heavy government repression, a still-fledgling workers' movement, and difficulties to apply to Japanese society. This can be most clearly seen in the fact that the early socialist movements in Japan were nowhere near the adoption of the much more radical theories of Western socialism. Early socialists rarely sought to destroy capitalism and class society, only to control and harness it. And if they ever dreamed of doing so, they also had a lot of work to do in order to shake off the traditions of and elitism that many of the founders of these socialist movements had, be it the reverence for the emperor or the samurai lineage, and not yet a political idea by workers for workers. But even with all the hardships and ups and downs, the socialist ideas and early labor movement had by 1917 started to leave a mark on Japanese society and had created a Japanese, not Western, foundation con to continue their struggle upon. This is also therefore the time period where I end the video. Just prior to the rise rights of 1918 and the Taisho democracy, which were not only affected by these movements and ideas, but would be where these ideas were to truly bloom into their own.